All right, welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today, man? Nathan, I'm great. How are you? I'm good, and I can tell from the three-way that we have on the video version of the podcast that we've got a guest lined up for this week's episode, and so I'm kind of excited about what we're going to be doing this week. Yeah, we have an extra special guest today, and I will tell you about him right after I tell you about his book. So nine years ago, someone, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, told me about this amazing book called The Microscript Rules. I went crazy when I got it, and I've been recommending it to people ever since. Fast forward to earlier this fall, um, my client, Billy Bross, emailed me, having recently spoken with the author of that book, Bill Schley. He wanted to introduce the two of us. Long story short, Bill Schley is what I would call an expert in branding that sells. Now, I know we've taken a lot of shots at branding on this podcast, and I think after getting to know Bill, he would be the first to agree with us. In fact, he's the only person I know who has a pretty foolproof system for creating brands that rocket companies to the top of their niche. He's been doing that for about 30 years, companies of all kinds. I was able to get him to come on the podcast and talk about that. Normally, uh, like I said, we direct marketers are a little hesitant to listen when anyone talks about branding. But I promise this, you'll want to hear what Bill has to say. Just as I have little doubt in my mind that you'll want to hear what I have to say first, which is this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear in this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Bill, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I am honored to be here, sir. Commander. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to tell you that um, not, not many people know this, but you helped me answer a question that has been bugging me for about 60 years. And I'm 68 years old, so it's a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, when I was a little boy, I used to take these things called Hall's Cough Drops. <laughs> and on the label, it said halls with mentholiptus and i asked my parents what was mentholiptus and they were always annoyed about everything about marketing and advertising packaging uh, mm. you know they were they were truth seeking science silly truth seeking scientists but they had no no room for stuff like that well when i moved to california i learned that there were eucalyptus trees and I kept searching for the mentholiptus tree. I couldn't find it. And then talking to you, I realized mentholiptus was invented on Times Square at 1515 Broadway at Ted Bates, where you worked. And that has a lot to do with branding. Could you explain? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because my boss, Bob Froelich, um, who is, I, I, I would consider one of the brand titans that you've never heard of. Most of them you never heard of. Uh, but he, cause he made it up. Now, here's the thing. I'm not sure that menthol lip, I know that was their word. I'm not sure that Froelich made up that word, but it was a brand or a brand or did like, like either the company did what Froelich made up, what Froelich made up was a name for what it did was he called it vapor action. And, and it's the simplest example of what, of, of how one little tiny idea, two words, you know, people think that these those old kinds of commercials aren't that sexy. But what's sexy, sales is pretty sexy, especially when Halls was a little tiny unknown brand from England, a cough drop over the counter cough drop brand. And there these have, you know, Halls. I'm not what do they have? They had uh, Dr. Smith's and remember Luden's and a few of those things. And everybody knew they didn't work at all. And so Halls came over and they hired Ted Bates, which is the place that I worked, and, and they threw it at Froelich. So they gave Froelich one of these. He decided, let me taste the, let me taste the thing. And he put it in his mouth and he spit it out into the freaking 
right into the, into the flower pot next to his desk. And he said, oh, it's like he, he talked with sort of a patrician accent because he'd gone to Princeton. Uh, in those days, all the ad guys, you know, because advertising was about this deep truth. And they all came across as like Harvard professors finding you the truth. That's what they did. OK, so he was uh, they wanted clients to think that. So he spit it out. He said, oh, it tastes like like Vicks VapoRub because it had all this menthol. And the trick was that that Halls, which that we used to call the candy, but Froelich, Froelich made us call it the medicine. Halls is basically the ma Halls is is two uh, percent. Let me see. Two percent menthol and and ninety eight percent sugar. That's what the medicine is. And it's about the same menthol you get in a menthol cigarette. But it but it comes up and it, you know, does that menthol thing in your sinuses and stuff makes you feel good. And ha and, and Froelich decided to use our little rules. He gave it a reason, the, the unique reason to believe, which was that only halls had vapor action. Now, no other cough drop, they all made the same claim, but we, you know, this is part of our rule is that you, you position on two things. Every positioning has two things. It has a, you, you want to have a unique proposition or a proposition and a unique reason to believe it. Because when someone wants something, they have an emotion, they want to buy for an emotional reason. They need you to give them an intellectual reason why. Permission sure. to buy, we used to call it. Sure. So yeah. that's all it was. So, and, but sometimes your product uh, differentiates on the reason to believe. And that's what Hall's was. Everybody said, oh, our cough drop will soothe your cough in your throat, right? In your nose. But he said, yeah, but Hall's has vapor action. And that little unknown brand in two years went to a 50% share of the market nationwide. That meant that every single time someone walked into a drugstore in Des Moines, Iowa, or Melbourne, Florida, half every other time they reached for a Halls. That's pretty powerful. And that, yeah. was, and that was based on an idea with a little, with words attached, right? Remember, we're copywriters. We attach words to an idea. So there you go. That's that's where it, that's where it actually happened. And he was a legend. Just so you know, Froelich also remember Madge the manicurist. I mean, we're gonna we date ourselves. Remember, remember, palm oil liquid softens hands while you do dishes. That's a classic mm -hmm. Ed Bates USP. It softens hands because everybody got dish pan hands, and now they said no. This is this one's actually you want to wash the dishes. The more you put your hands into this, the better your hands are gonna be. It's like, I'm done. Softens hands while you do dishes. And then they created a character called Madge the Manicurist, and she tells them, and the, and, and the woman's got, and she's saying, that's, well, you know, as a matter of fact, your hands are, are, you're, are soaking in the palm of the woman. What's she say? Oh, yeah. The woman yanks her hands away. She says, no, you can put them back. You're soaking in it. You know, it softens hands while you do dishes. And that was a frolic did those kind of things. The key thing you told me, was a big idea and in copy we also talk about big idea maybe it's i mean in direct response maybe yeah. it's the same maybe it's not but you've yeah. actually come up with a way to create a big idea which boggles my mind could you sort of walk us through that look the one thing i figured out after 30 years is that all this it called the universal theory of everything that all of these truths when you're trying to figure out brand branding you're trying to write you're trying to find peel back everything and find the ultimate level of truth the one thing that's the most p important possible thing that you can say that i want that only you can do and when you get to that point someone has to buy from you and 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 so and i actually learned this from a, a member of the israeli navy seals he's the guy that made me realize that, that he said when you know when you're behind the lines when your guys are pinned down you're 500 miles from safety and all hell's breaking loose. I'd, I'd say, what do you do? Because we found he was a major, he was our driver in Israel. Turned out he was a major in the Maglan, which was a secret Navy SEALs unit of the Israelis. And he said, we sit down, I get my guys together and we just say, we ask each other, where is the center? That's the first, that's the, in other words, what, what do we got to do? What's the most important thing? And what do we got to do right now? And when you do it, when you're, when you're starting to write a letter, um, you're trying to find that one belief. When I'm trying to brand a company, I'm trying to find where is the center. It's it's a, and every truth comes down to something. It's if it's not simple, it's not the center. You know, 
Um, but so it's all related. I mean, the big idea, my, I look for a big idea. I'm looking for one idea that a company can stand for. When you're writing a letter, you're right, looking for one idea that is so critical that it's going to sell this product right now. And like I said, I call you copywriting guys, the Navy SEALs of, of marketing. Because you guys, you guys are exquisitely trained and I think exquisitely selected. I'm blowing smoke up your ass now, but I believe this. Um, uh, tactical guys, which is exactly what the Navy SEALs are. They go in, they put them on a mission. They're the only guys in the military that are allowed to go off and, and, and wing it their own way because there's no rules for, they go in and do things there are no rules for. Um, they figure it out. They, 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 deal, they deal with a mission and then they get out and no one knows who they are. <laughs> but they do, right? Sounds just except, like uh, the kind of copywriters we are, yeah. yeah except, except you guys make a lot more money than they do. Right. That's true. But, but our lives might not be as exciting all the time, but still. Yeah, yeah. But they end up, believe me, they end up they end up pretty broken down and beat up. But they're they're good guys and they're all really smart too. It's interesting. So I think, you know, we're doing the same thing. I just did it I just did it in a different framework. So, you know, at, at Bates, you know, you had a big product, it was a mass market product, or you were or you were branding a company. And all that meant was a brand, and, and I was always trying to figure out rules, and the more I thought about rules, I realized that rules rules has to be short or it's not a rule. Maybe you get, you get a sentence made for a rule. A brand, here's a definition that no one else in the world is going to ever tell anybody, and that is just a brand is just a difference attached to your name. That's what a brand is. Ooh, say uh, that again. A brand is a difference attached to your name. That's fantastic. Okay. Now, here's the thing, though. It's a very special kind of difference. See, it's a difference that makes you want to buy. So, Fra uh, Nazi, I hate the Nazi, but uh, uh, the Nazis are a brand, right? They stand for a lot of things, okay? Yeah. You don't want to buy them, but that, that's it's a brand. If you want a selling brand, it's a special, special kind of idea. So, and then what I did is I broke it down. This is, they never taught us, but this is, we broke it down so we could teach it. So we said, it's an idea that has, it, it, it stands up to five tests, okay? A, a, a dominant, it's a, I call it a dominant selling idea, this one idea. It's, it first of all has to be superlative. It has to say you're the best at something because no one ever went out to buy the second or third or fourth best when they had a product. They went out to buy the best thing they could possibly find, the first thing they remembered, as long as they had money to buy it. So it has to be superlative or find something else. The next thing, it has to be believable. Uh, sorry, it has to be important. In other words, they have to want it. So my favorite story is you can say, well, our, our, our uh, you know, clothing store, we have the biggest selection of brown ties in San, Anto in San Francisco. Biggest selection of brown ties. <laughs> Well, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, but it's, and nobody wants it. So they have to want it. The next thing, number three, is it has to be believable coming from you. Okay. Now, all these big corporations with all their, with all their phony arrogance, which they all have, these corporate people, they think that their brands are, they breathe their own fumes. They think their brands are so incredibly important that if they just put their name on anything, the world will go out instantly, buy it, and believe it. And to prove that that's wrong, see, you have to believe it has to be believable coming from you. Um, imagine Colgate bacon. No. Yeah. Okay. And I like well, bacon too. Yeah. Guess what? Well, the geniuses at Colgate actually, you can go on the internet. They actually put that product in stores for a while until it was such a ridiculous disaster. They yanked it out. That's how stupid they really are in terms of brand extensions. The point is no one believes a Colgate toothpaste. They don't associate it. Make good bacon. You know, what makes good bacon boar's head, but I wouldn't buy boar's head toothpaste either. Would I? So it has to be believable coming from you. Be logical. Then it has to be measurable. And that means you have to prove it. I have to see it working. I give like another example of that. You know, clear still used to put on zits when you were a teenager. It yeah. used to you put it on and it tingled. Well, the yeah. tingle they put the tingle into it. It, it, it the tingle had nothing was just an ingredient that it was had nothing to do with the working of clear still, but they put it in. So you put it on and it sort of itched and it thing, oh I can and they'd say, Clear still, you can feel it working. All right. Yeah. They make it measurable. This is the kind of ideas you would come up with. Don't be, don't be so amazed. This, this is the shit you do every day. And the last thing is, because uh, it's so creative to come up with those ideas. And then the last thing, it has to be ownable by you. 
And so because if somebody else already owns a brand like like let's say I pick anything, but they own Safe Car, like Volvo does, or if they own it, the fact is that what they taught us at Bates was if you say the same thing. What people do, what they hear, they don't even hear that it's you. They they hear that commercial for that um, proposition, and they think it's they, they think it's it's what they remember is oh yeah, I heard Volvo say that. They 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 only connect that number one thing in their head. They don't. So if somebody else already owns that position, you gotta you gotta shift a little bit to the left or the right and create a new position that you can own. Just and that's done every single day in branding. Because brand, brands grow on trees, they're like little branches that sprout off. So the first the first brand there ever, uh, first position was a horseless carriage. They called it an automobile, and all anybody made was automobiles. And then someone decided, you know, I'm going to make a heavy duty one for, and I'm going to put it so that I can carry stuff. It's got heavier springs and it's going to have a stronger engine. That was called the truck. That's all they did, you know. But then they had trucks. So then they said, well, okay, I'm going to make a utility truck and I'm going to make a, a box, you know box truck every it is branches off branches each one of those was a new category and someone said we're the number one it's in pickup trucks and that's all that happens every day so it has to be that special that difference attached to your name has to be superlative has to be important not to want it. it has to be believable coming from you it has to be measurable i gotta see it working remember rich corinthian leather yeah, you got you can smell it. You can you can say, "Oh my God, I'm smelling that rich Corinthian leather." You know, they put that in there so you could to see it working, and uh, to prove it, you have to prove it. And lastly, it has to be ownable. There you go. And that's awesome. And, I'm 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 going to take an abrupt shift because we're running yeah, out of yeah, time, yeah. and I don't want to miss your book. This book, yeah. the Microscript Rules. Tell it. Tell us one thing about it because I want to also talk about your special surprise at the end. Oh, okay. The microscript rules. What happened was, so we had uh, learned all this stuff, and I wrote a book called Why Johnny Can't Brand, Rediscovering the Lost Art of the Big Idea. So it was all about how to find that big idea. And there was one thing missing, um, and I discovered that when I was on a radio show, a political radio show, um, and I was talking on, about what the Republicans were doing and why they kept winning elections. And I say, well, the Republicans, you know, uh, the Democrats give you a white paper, and the Republicans give you a tagline. I said, what they do is they give you a little, it's, it's, they give, they give so that Bubba can be in going to a bar and he can say, you know what? I ain't, I ain't voting for no flip flopper. Okay. That guy's a flip flopper. So he gave him the language to say, I said, they're giving him little micro scripts to say. And we, and, and we both at the same time said, holy shit, you know what? That's what that, those are micro scripts are pretty important. They're giving them little scripts to re repeat word by word. And then I realized that's what taglines were. And I realized that, you know, what, it, coming up with strategy is useless unless you do that last, take that last step over the goal line, which is give them this little a, a sentence or so to remember and repeat. And that's a micro script. And, and then I found out it, it doesn't just sell products. I mean, with melts in your mouth, not in your hand. Or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Those are microscripts. It doesn't just sell products. It also changes history. Okay. Uh, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Right. Yeah. I have a dream today. We want equal pay for equal work. Hey, um, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It changed those six words change history. That's what a microscript is. So I wrote a whole book about it. And and that's the final piece of the puzzle. So there's I have two books. I have the book about how the big idea, but then you know coming up the uh, telling your story in a sentence or less. Yeah, I mean I, I wanted to talk about the the yeah. three things on the cover. The microscript rules is the title, but yeah. it's not what people hear; it's what they repeat, and that's the Bubba example in the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and this one everybody should know about this: how to tell your story and differentiate your brand in a sentence or less yeah 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 and the reason i changed it i did a second edition the reason i made that the tagline is so then i'd be out trying to pitch the book you know here and there and i and i'd be at these uh entrepreneur events and i and they want to what's your book about and i had to tell them one line and and you know it made me find a microscript that would sell the book in one sentence and that was the sentence where they go oh i need that i'm going to teach you how to do your elevator pitch in a sentence or less yeah and they go yeah. oh 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 okay i need that 
And then I realized, you know what, that's the one. But but uh, it's not important what people it's not what people hear. It's what they repeat is is is, is just another microscript. And it's in, it's very, very important. It's just that it's it wasn't the, it shouldn't be the tagline of the book. So that's yeah. where that. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's like a prehead in in a sales letter. It's like the pre-headline yeah. or the eyebrow, you know. Yeah. So, in the few remaining minutes we have left, tell us about what you're going to release in the new year. Okay. Well, David, yeah, I got pretty exciting. So, um, I uh, I I realize, you know, we we all get pretty frustrated in branding because we and and marketing because we know that we know how to do it. We know that all the other people that are saying they know how to do it are ninety percent just full of it. They don't know what they're doing, and so, you know, we kind of want it. We know the truth, and we want to get it out to more people. My problem was that I was like to fly the airplane. I, didn't, I and so I would go I, and I I learned these things and I went out and I was consultant and I would go into a company myself, talk to the CEO and after 6 months we figure out do the brand and I and I could do about 12 companies a year. But I kept going to I kept, you know, I, I people would ask me to do, you know, speak or talk to students and stuff and and or go in uh, you know, you watch these incubators and these young companies and every single every single person ever had a business needs this needs these fundamental principles cuz the brand is re the brand and when we break it down to what it is, it's actually your strategy. It's it's actually what business you're in. It's actually your vision, mission, and purpose all in one. I mean, if I make the world's safest cars, that's my mission. It's my vision, it's my purpose, and it's what I do. So that's how important it is. And and then it guides all your decision making. And I and every little company needed this. And so then COVID comes along and everybody's going online with course. And I realized this is how we can finally scale this damn thing. You know, I never thought about it that way, but I, I, I need to scale it. And and online courses was the way to do it. And so I saw the masterclass.com. I decided this was a, my magnum opus. So I was going to make, we were going to make it to that production level. And we're doing an online course uh, called the Brand Titans Master Course. And in 15 very short classes, I'm going to teach you every single thing that I know and every single rule that I learned and every technique that I know in, in 30 years of doing this. And, I, and I'm, I'm confident that nobody else in the world is anywhere is teaching it like this. Well, yeah, but, I mean, uh, we, we were talking about this earlier and even just before the show today, you were telling me it, it suddenly dawned on you when you were at Ted Bates. And, and by the way, I want to mention yeah. when you were in that gladiator tower, yeah, I was in Rockefeller Center, about a third of a mile away, over okay. McGraw Hill, in another Gladiator Tower, and yeah. uh, and and so it, th these these guys, they never told you anything. They yeah. they kind of expected you to get it because they had it, and it was up to you to figure it out. Yeah, and, and it was true for everybody because nobody had ever spelled out how to do it, and you realized over 30 years that there could this could be made into a system and yeah. this, is, this is not yeah. a system you dreamed up on a on a napkin at a, a starbucks in a uh hotel penthouse in las vegas this is something that came out of actual experience of elevating people to the top of their niche over and over yeah. again with brands it's true yeah yeah yeah, it was, it was true. Everything you're saying is true. I'm thinking about it. I, you know, cause the things I go, I go to work scared every day, every day. I, I, I had my, my heart in my mouth, you know, riding the train in from Connecticut because I was going to walk into this freaking gladiator pit. You're right. And I, and I, and just the way I, I, I kept, so I started watching, they, but see, they had a formula, they were doing it. They knew all the techniques, but they didn't even, they didn't even ask themselves how they did it. They, they couldn't explain to you really how it was, they did it. it. It was all unconscious competence, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's all yeah. intuitive. They, they, they had a way they knew if they were on yeah. track or not, but they couldn't explain it. The one place that did was the place that I lucked out into going, which was Ted Bates. Now, everybody hated Ted Bates because they thought they were a bunch of thugs, and they were. They were a bunch of thugs. They moved to 1515 Broadway in the middle of the worst part of, you know, Broadway in those days was really a disgusting place. I lived there then, I know. Yeah, yeah. And they moved down there to save money because they wanted to, they didn't, they didn't want to think they're, because uh, they were at 666 Madison Avenue. And, uh, but they had, they had this theory of the USP. 
that Rossa Rees wrote the book about the USP. So Bates right. had a way to do it. Um, and all the other ones like Doyle Dane and all the creative revolution guys in advertising, they were making those cute commercials. Um, they just told you it was magic. So you, you had to hire them because it was magic. It was too, they couldn't explain it to you. You'd never understand it. It was this magic alchemy of creativity and brilliance and truth. And, you know, they acted like they were, you know, they were Shakespeare, but yeah. Bates actually had written down, you know, you do this, this, and this. And you come up with a USP. Um, so they did, but that's as far as they went. They're, I think they were the only ones that close to having a method. Yeah, but you, you got to understand this 2021, um, Nathan can confirm this. We have spent so many episodes trying to figure out how to tell people how to come up with the USP, how to tell people how to come up with a big idea. And yeah. I think you've, you, I mean, Nathan, wouldn't you agree? Don't he's 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 answered a lot of questions that we've been grappling with for for a while here. Yeah, I am just gonna say I feel like this episode has been chock full of gold nuggets, and uh, for me, just the idea of the microscripts having something so powerful that people can repeat it, and in copywriting, having that. When somebody reads a piece of yeah. copy and they want to buy something, but then they have to think, well, my wife is going to say, oh, you're not going to buy another one of those, are you? Or mm -hmm. my boss is going to say, do we really need that? Or my friends are going to say, oh, man, here he goes buying one of those things again. Having that little microscript is that they can repeat, that they can use to justify their their decision to make the purchase. Um, that was the biggest gold nugget for me out of this. And, and yeah, it well, kind of wraps well, up. Yeah, there's two things I will be for you. I, I want to say one thing. The um, what it is defining what it is is that you know the dominant selling idea of those five those five let's say rules right or those five part elements. But to find them, the questions you ask are more important than the answers at the beginning of this process. And I write about that too. And and David, you ask a lot of the same questions in a, in a different way. Um, you drive to something though that's that's deeper than what that we. Even I mean, what we should we should always be driving for you guys instinctively drive to it, which is actually the 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 deepest deepest possible motivation, what the real human motivation underneath whatever it is. But that's different. But the same questions are, you know, basically we ask, you know, it basically just say what what do we do that nobody else does? That was, a, that was in every meeting. Another thing was, but what do we need? What does the world need us to do that only we can do? Another one I came up with this one: the onlys. What are our, what are our onlys? You know, and it helps yeah. people focus a little bit and, and find these things. And, and as they stray off, you ask them again. You ask them again. You've got to hold them to, and hold yourself. Sure, that sure. It, it does, you it's get, on surface. Yeah. Yeah. As you, as you get down mm -hmm. to some of those things, I forget one of the other ones, but there are a couple of these critical questions that are, they're the eternal questions that if you answer them, you're going to start and you, and with practice, because see, it takes practice. People sure. walk and think I'm smart. The only reason I, that I, is because I, I've been seeing patterns for 30 years. So I can yeah. see a little tiny crack in the, that they can't see. I see because I've seen it before. And there's a so, word for that. Yeah. I mean, on a, on a personal note, something that Nathan said opens up a whole new world for me because yeah. um, I don't know what I'm going to say to my friends if I buy another guitar. But yeah. if I can come up with a good microscript, I can buy as many more guitars as I want. Yeah, listen, I got to tell you, this is the, this is this thing I was saying. So I'm thinking about what you guys do and what you're so brilliant at versus what I do, right? Because because I don't think I could do what you do. You guys are too good at it. But I but what the thing is that after they read that four page letter that at the end of it, it, it it's irresistible and they and they only have one decision. Either I buy this now for this incredibly ridiculously small amount of money that I can't wait to pay <laughs> or I'm going to die. That's what you guys do. It's yeah, either back or die. That's a, you're going to die right now. Your, your life is going to be a complete. So, but after they read that four page letter, right? If anyone 10 minutes later said, what was that? What did you just buy? What was it about? You know what they're going to give you? If you're lucky, one sentence right that's right. what your brain does 
and that's and and, and, and that and that was Nathan's point that we need to make sure we yeah. have that sentence in our letters. So because we always yeah. talk about intellectually justifying the emotional desire, but yeah. sometimes a reason for refunds is that we didn't give them a way to intellectually to verbally yeah. in one sentence justify the purchase yeah. to their wife, their husband, their right. banker, their mother in law, their right. elks club, whatever. Yeah. We need the words because they're not copywriters because our brains, the, the little bit of neuroscience that I read about before I read the microscript rules, which is why did, why are these so important? It's because people, you know, these are the gut feelings that we have. We Our entire brains run on something called heuristics, which are just little rules of thumb. Our entire brains. When you drive a car, when you fly a jet plane, everything you do is these little rules of thumb that instantly align you. So, for example, when a, when a, when a little kid you throw a baseball up in the air and the little kid instinctively knows and he can catch it because his brain is, he's born with a rule of thumb. He, he, he either do a thousand different differential equations to calculate the trajectory or one rule of thumb. Keep the, keep your eye on the ball, keep the angle constant. Now that one thing, that little rule is the same as doing a thousand differential equations because it just works. And so our brains instinctively, because we had to know how to think in, in, in seconds, every time we, crawled up behind our rock we were going to get eaten by something and our brains had to think really really fast and so it had a, they had to brand something friend or foe in, in in an instant they had to remember things and that's 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 what we did and so we still do that you know um yeah. we're, we're gonna but, have to wrap this up soon though yeah, yeah. But we're not cop but we're not copywriters so the thing is when you give somebody a little line like that to say what happens in vegas stays in vegas or or five hour energy they will they they oh what what the best one of all, the 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 uh, the jewelers do this. They give they give you a, a little story, a one sentence story to go on with this little uh, design that they have, and then the boyfriend can tell his girlfriend. So he gives her this little diamond thing that's sort of squirrely shaped, and he says they call it a journey, and she now wants to have sex with him, but he didn't make that up. The jeweler gave him that microscript, and he was so happy. So the jeweler it. was sort of like a procurer or a pimp, right? Yeah, that's what the jeweler, that's what the jeweler does. The jeweler, but the jewelers are masters at that. We yeah, we, we got we got to stop here. And to all oh. the jewelers on on the right. um on among our listeners, isn't it good to know who you really are? So, um, <laughs> oh God, I apologize. No, we oh, yeah. we're just kidding oh, around. Wow. But see, the twenty five minutes goes by quick. Real quick, before we're out of here, Bill, where can people find your books? And if you already know where they can find the course that you're going to be putting out as well. Okay, guys. Well, you can find the books, The Microscript Rules. My name is Bill Schley, if you can remember my name. It's S-C-H-L-E-Y. And if you go on Amazon and put my name in, you'll find Why Johnny Can't Brand. You'll find the microscript rules. You'll find an entrepreneur book called The Unstoppables, where I met those Navy SEALs. And you'll find the first book I ever wrote called uh, the, the Power of Ten, which was the book that I wrote because I was procrastinating from writing a, mar a marketing book. And I procrastinated so much, I wrote a book about weightlifting. It's the ultimate act of procrastination of all mm -hmm. time. And then the course is called the Brand Titans uh, Master Course, The Brand Titans Master Course. If you actually go on, on YouTube right now and type in The Brand Titans Master Course, you can see our trailer and you can get the free preview that I was going to charge money for. You're going to get it for free if you want to look at that. But I'd, I'd like to invite you to come back when it's ready and, oh, and we'll yeah. talk about that. Oh, absolutely. We'll have, a, have a URL so, for people. Yeah. Well, I love doing this, man. I, 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 it's been so many years since I got to sit down with real life copywriters again. It's, it's really, it really is a kick for me. Thank yeah. you for coming on listeners. If you enjoyed this and you want to check out more episodes, make sure you head over to copywriterspodcast.com. While you're there, subscribe to the show. And until next time, we will catch you later. See you later.